Hey guys, so I'm here with Hilary Doyle, and we're going to be talking about a few of the German vehicles here at the collection at the National Armored Cavalry Collection here in Fort Benning, Georgia. And this one is going to be our first one. It has an awesome story, and we're going to talk about how it fit into the war, how well it worked, and some of its background, and then some of its design features. So hmm. why don't you start off with an introduction of what we got behind us here. Okay, we've got a um, Leichter Panzer Speywagen, which is a observation vehicle, and it's uh, a version for FU, which is Funk, the German for radio. And this is a radio car. Now this car was part of a team of these four-wheeled armoured cars that did reconnaissance. This was the communications link back to headquarters and it supported three scout cars which were just running around trying to find out what the enemy were up to and they would signal back to this car with flags. How many of these were in a team? Uh, it started off, the original concept was three scout cars, one of these, and one with the two centimeter gun, which was the, uh, the protection vehicle for that reconnaissance unit. And that's how they worked. They, the uh, two centimeter gun provided anti-aircraft protection and ground fire protection. These guys were meant to stay out of trouble with the radios and the guys in the scout cars ran around. Now the scout car was the, they each have a, uh, a number which designates them. This is a 223, SDKFZ 223. The armor protection vehicle is an SDKFZ 222 with the two centimeter gun. And the scout cars were SDKFZ 221. Mm. And they, the 221s look the same in photographs, but they're actually a much smaller vehicle than this. They're much narrower and have a le more than a ton less weight in them. So that's how they were, in theory, supposed to be more mobile. Um, this vehicle had two radio sets. It had a receiver and a, a sender, as the Germans called there, for transmitting. And they were able to radio back to the headquarters. Now, I'm damaged on this exit at the moment, but amazing that we have it. This is actually the uh, frame antenna, the wow. radio antenna, and in the pre-war period, because these cars originally started in 1935, the aerial had to be the length of the transmission signal. So they got this by having it circling the car, and they could raise it up and down with this, was the, and they would raise it up. And then if they were in a particularly long distance situation, they actually had a series of poles which were a mast they would stick up five meters, so uh, five and a half yards up into the sky and a star antenna on the top of that to signal back to headquarters. And that's the concept of these cars. Now, of course, over time, uh, many, many changes occurred and the scout cars were eventually deemed to be not so effective because they only had a machine gun and uh, they, they weren't capable of doing the job that they were supposed to. So more and more the, gun, the vehicle, the 222, which was the one with the two centimeter gun, became the scout car as well. Mm. But of course it, had, it still had a disadvantage in that it was a ton heavier than the uh, scout cars. But if you like now we could maybe take a look around and I'll show you some of the features of the vehicle. Yeah, let's check it out. All of these cars were built on, the, on a common chassis and that chassis was made by a company called Hork and this is a 3.5 litre V8 engine at the rear of the vehicle and Hork is one of the circles of the Audi of today this is part of the Audi company they supplied the chassis and then the bodies were built by armour companies in the different sizes and shapes required um, this one was actually from 1942 it actually was manufactured by an Austrian company called Böhler. Um, all the previous armoured cars from 1935 all the way th through to 1941 were manufactured by a German company called Deutsche Edelstahl in Hanover. Features of, of this are common. They had this type of door that the Russians copied uh, in their armoured cars because it falls down and the guy can roll out from either side. They're very small inside. You, the driver sat on the, basically on the floor on a sm small cushion seat arrangement, but he had to operate the clutch and the uh, brake system up the front there, uh, almost horizontal. And the steering wheel is inverted so that the steering wheel is not sticking into his stomach. Gives a bit extra room. So now 
This is the radio rack across here in this particular model. Down below you have, in the middle, you, uh, down below you had transformers, but in the middle you have the receiver, and on the top went a uh, more powerful transmitter. And this bar across the top here is for raising and lowering the frame antenna that I spoke about a moment or two. And then round on the right side of the vehicle, here just inside the door, is the stand for a small radio for transmitting to other vehicles in the, in the unit. Because again, as I said, this is 1941-42 period and they had started to put radios into the vehicles and they weren't as dependent on flags as they had been. The commander sat in the rear of the vehicle and had this small shield, which is, although it looks like a turret, it's not actually a turret. The German term was Schutzschild because it moves around on the pivot mount of the machine gun. So he had a machine gun for self-defense of the vehicle. Um, the engine is at the rear, hidden away in here. It's a V8 3.5 litre engine, quite, quite uh, powerful for its time. Oh, it, I mean, they can't go very fast because they've been, you know, the wheelbase and the weight of the vehicle and so forth. So you, you preferably stick to below 30 miles an hour. You know, something like that. You can go faster, but you wouldn't want to be doing it because they, these also have a feature of early German vehicles. Um, they have four-wheel steering. So in a tight corner, they can steer, they can engage the four-wheel steering, so the rear wheel steer, so they can turn the rear wheels and they have a very slick turning circle that you wouldn't expect of a vehicle of that period and time. They had pretty good road holding, but obviously over time, and um, this was somewhat superseded when they moved to the uh, to the Russian front where there was a lack of roads and there was mud and, and so forth. And then the, the tendency was to require more and more tracks. So you got this, the function of these vehicles was gradually taken over by half tracks like the 250 and 251, um, which became radio cars and so forth, exact equivalents of what these were. This particular vehicle is really quite exceptional in that we know the history of it um, because the chassis number which is stamped into the into the chassis we can find that in the records of a unit that served at Kursk in Russia um, when they returned back from Russia after uh, the towards the end of 43 they were supposed to uh, hand over all their armored equipment but for some reason, they didn't hand over their radio car. Maybe because they considered ah, it's just a radio car, and they didn't think about the fact that it was armoured. But it's not not heavy armour. So this stayed with them throughout. Uh, first of all, Italy, and then in in France. So this is a remarkable uh, thing to know what some of the background history is on, on a vehicle. Really good. Now, an, another reason why I particularly like this uh, car is I'm a trustee of the Wheel Foundation. And at the moment, the Wheel Foundation is restoring three of these four-wheeled armoured cars. Uh, the first one, the 1939 223, just like this one, but obviously an earlier model. Um, and then we have one of the protection vehicles, the 222 with two centimetre gun, that's a 1940 version. And then finally, we have a 1943 261, which is just a pure radio car with no a little turret, no machine gun, just they managed to get an extra crewman in, get extra radio sets in and use it just for the radio side of things.